Estonian soldier performs naval ballad of Bismarck. My friends, Bismarck is dead. It's at the bottom of the ocean. The Brits destroyed it. They took us from second biggest battleship of the world. Yamato was the first, Bismarck is the second. But Bismarck is ginormous, like Yamato. We listened to Sabaton Bismarck, a very cool song. Whew, it was good. And now we're actually going to learn how it went down. The Operations Room, a wonderful channel, made a video about it a long time ago. We're gonna watch, we're gonna know exactly how this behemoth died. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll perform you one of my other naval ballads that I totally wrote myself. Oh, Christ! Patrons, I cannot go on without them. We have the AT, anti-tank. Thank you for uh, supporting the channel, anti-tank. We have prisoner 24601. If you don't know that reference, then it's from, uh, it's, it's Jean Valjean from Les Miserables. Les Miserables, right. Prisoner 24601. I'm son Jean Valjean. It's a really good movie, I suggest you watch it. Thank you, Jean Valjean, for becoming a patron. And finally, we have Ron Wyckoff. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you want to be like those guys, you want to be your, you want your name to be read out loud. You want to get some fame and recognition for the good things you have done. Then become a patron of this channel. The link is in the description below. Now let's learn about how the Bismarck died. The Bismarck. A brand new German battleship that some believe to be unsinkable leaves Gertenhaven. If the Royal Navy can't find and stop her, she will do fatal damage to the Atlantic convoys that are feeding Britain and keeping her in the war. <coughs> the great pursuit has begun. <coughs> With the growing U-boat threat in the Atlantic, Britain is struggling to keep her supply lines open. Naval convoys transport food, oil and war material from the rest of the Empire and the North Americas, but the silent underwater hunters are doing great damage. The situation is bleak, <coughs> but in May 1941 still just sustainable. However, the German plan for Bismarck, Operation Rheinerbund, is to escape the British naval blockade on Germany and make her way into the North Atlantic free to prey on merchant shipping at range with her H 15 inch guns and with 320mm thick belt armour there's nothing the convoy escorts can do 320mm thick belt armour, that's 22 centimeters. We watched Yamato, its thickest armor on the ship was 50 centimeters or half a meter, which is insane, it is crazy. And this one has belt armor. I, I'm not sure it's not the thickest, but it's the belt armor of 32 centimeters, which is also pretty thick, if you know what I mean. Do about it. If successful, Bismarck could deal a damaging blow to the British war effort. After skirting the Norwegian coast, Bismarck arrives at Bergen with her escort heavy cruiser, Prinz Eugen, for a final resupply. The Royal Navy surface fleet dominates the North Sea, so they hope to remain undetected. They never see the Coastal Command Spitfire that spots them, and return German recon flights over Scarpa Float show the British fleet still anchored. Vice Admiral Gunther Luchens has no reason to believe the British know of their whereabouts, and the two German ships sail north. The Spitfire returns the photographs of Bismarck and the Royal Navy deploys its first forces to find her. <coughs> British battleship HMS Prince of Wales, battlecruiser HMS Hood and six destroyers slip their moorings and set sail into the Atlantic. HMS Hood, jewel of the Royal Navy, the most... So they're gonna... Ch it's, it's much more glorious and much more um, mischievous than the going down of Yamato which was just two battles and it's dead but now it's... 
a one photograph, you know, counterintelligence, now they're gonna chase the damn ship. Uh, I remember that they had many battles with it also. It's much more glorious, I think. Powerful ship in the world for 20 years is about to meet her match. <clears throat> Other ships are already patrolling the Atlantic, enjoying the search for Bismarck. Cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk are the first to spot her. They are no match in firepower, so try to keep a safe distance and observe. On the morning of the 24th, <coughs> Hood and the Prince of Wales arrive. The two pairs of heavy ships are pretty evenly matched, but the wind is blowing spray into the rangefinders of the British ships. At 5.52am, they open fire. Hood initially fires on the Eugen, before changing to target the Bismarck itself. <coughs> Okay, the first 55, battle. Bismarck and the Prince Eugen fire back. The Prince of Wales and Bismarck sustain some damage in the exchanges, and Bismarck develops an oil leak. Hood takes a hit. Oil, right, oil leak, a small thing, but it can turn into a huge thing also. We, we saw in the Yamato episode also that small thing, if you, if you damage the rotors, if you damage the engine of that ship, it's a sitting duck. Uh, no point in making ships that big. You can just damage some small part of it and it cannot even move anymore. So yeah, one lucky shell is needed here. It's causing fire. At 6am, a new salvo tears through Hood's weak top deck armor. A shell burrows into the heart of the ship and detonates. The Ooh. entire spine of the ship snaps in two as the magazine explodes. <clears throat> Both rear turrets are blown into the sea. Within seconds, the mighty hood, the naval superpower of the interwar years, sinks. The naval superpower of the interwar years, but now its time has come to an end. Maybe one, once upon a time, 30 years ago, it might have been the biggest, most powerful ship in the world. Because after the First World War, ship uh, building only was in its uh, baby shoes, or how do you say, infants? It was young, it was really young. Uh, but now, the Bismarck takes down the hood like it's nothing. The first casualty of a battle. This is how, I think nowadays, aircraft carriers would take down this Bismarck as it was nothing. This is how much the world changes in 30 years. Now outnumbered and taking punishing hits, the Prince of Wales disengages, defeated. Luchens realizes that Bismarck took too much damage in her last engagement to carry on the convoy raiding mission. She will have to make her escape to Brest for repairs. The British Admiralty is shocked by the loss of HMS Hood and decide to commit more of their Atlantic naval firepower to find and sink Bismarck. Oh, they are committed! Bismarck's oil slick is giving the Suffolk and the Norfolk an easy shadow to direct the first reinforcements approaching to join the chase. Aircraft carrier Victorious, battleship King <coughs> George V, and battlecruiser Repulse move in from the east. There's a problem though. Such was the need to react quickly to send ships into the Atlantic to find Bismarck. Victorious has been routed straight from exercises, where she was introducing her new squadron of swordfish torpedo bombers to ship operations. Her pilots are not operational, have no experience, and some have only performed a carrier landing for the first time days previously. Prince Eugen is to continue the raiding mission alone. Bismarck turns and fires on her pursuers to allow Eugen to escape. At 10pm or 6pm local time, Victorious launches her nine inexperienced swordfish crews and former fighters to observe the attack. They have difficulties finding Bismarck, but eventually make their attacks under heavy fire. One swordfish drops a torpedo which detonates against the hull, but doesn't cause any major damage. As day turns to night, the pursuers lose sight of Bismarck and then lose radar contact. Right, I was talking in the Imato episode how um, these huge ships have a lot of AA guns, but if you have plenty enough of planes, AA guns are not going to do much against the planes. I'm sure Bismarck has anti-aircraft abilities, anti-aircraft weaponry, and in this case, if only nine planes attack, yes, you can do something. You can focus your AA guns on those small numbers, but if you have 50 or 60 planes attacking, not much you can do at all. But in this case, nine planes might even take them down. Bismarck changes course directly towards France. <coughs> Away to the southeast, the Royal Navy has ordered battleship Rodney and cruisers Dorsetshire and Edinburgh <coughs> to join the chase. Four Holy hell, they are committed! From Gibraltar, made up of carrier Ark Royal, battlecruiser Renown, and cruiser Sheffield. <coughs> He's the pursuers surrounded. are searching for Bismarck. Luchens makes a mistake. 
He continues to transmit frequent radio message reports to the German Admiralty, letting them know that he now intends to sail to Brest. Radio direction finders across Britain pick up the message and are able to broadly triangulate the Bismarck's position at each message transmission. The code breakers at Bletchley Park then use their top secret <coughs> Enigma machine to decipher the message. The British Admiralty now know where she is and where she is heading. Five destroyers, including one Polish, are retasked from escorting nearby convoy WS-8B to the chase. Coastal Command aircraft are dropping mines on the approaches into Brest. British luck changes. A long-range RAF Catalina flying boat finds what it came to search for and reports the location of Bismarck to the British fleet. The problem to overcome now is that the Bismarck is still matching the speed of the Royal Navy ships. To catch it would require slowing it down. A few hours later, Ark Royal of Force H launches her swordfish torpedo bombers. It <coughs> hasn't been communicated to the pilots that light cruiser Sheffield has used her speed to catch up with the Bismarck and shadow her, and in the terrible weather conditions they misidentify the two ships. No. They drop their torpedoes against HMS Sheffield. Oh, no. Luckily, the new and untested magnetic detonators in the torpedoes explode the weapons prematurely, and Sheffield gets away unscathed. <laughs> There's so much going wrong already for the British. They've lost one ship, they've had to route every ship to chase for the Bismarck, leaving their other convoys unprotected, and now it's a friendly fire almost. Well, they haven't lost much, but it's taken already too much from the Royal Navy. The mishap allows Ark Royal to replace the faulty detonators for use against Bismarck. Fifteen swordfish again launch, and this time they find Bismarck. Oh, okay. They attack from different directions <coughs> almost simultaneously. Under ferocious AA fire, three torpedoes hit. Critically, one has jammed her rudder, and she loses nearly all steering. Oh boy! Vice Admiral Luce. This is the end of the ship. You lose steering, you're gone. You're a sitting duck now. It can go around in circles, as I understand. And no ships, no uh, planes are lost. As Remember Midway. How many planes did Zeros take down before Japanese carriers were hit? They took down over a hundred planes almost before carriers were hit. Zeros, the planes. AA fire doesn't do that much damage. So Bismarck only has AA fire, anti aircraft. You need carriers, brother. You need carriers sends a message to Germany. Ship unmaneuverable. We shall fight to the last shell. Overnight, the Royal Navy repositioned for the final engagement, while destroyers harass Bismarck with torpedo attacks. She may be disabled, but the guns that sunk HMS Hood in six minutes are still very much a threat. At 8.43am, HMS Rodney and King George V move head-on against Bismarck. Both battleships' foremost guns fire the first salvos, and as they fall, the Bismarck returns a full broadside against them. The 55 second flight time of the massive barrage is tense, but the shells fall short of the British ships. Cruiser <coughs> Norfolk joins the engagement with her 8 inch guns. At 8 miles range, King George V and Rodney turn to bring their broadsides to bear, and Cruiser Dorsetshire joins the engagement. Bismarck is beginning to take hits to her superstructure, igniting deck fires. Rodney aggressively continues to close the distance. A shell lands danger close off the starboard bow. It's the closest to a direct hit the British receive, as the return fire from Bismarck begins to wane under the ferocious bombardment. She's lost hydraulic power to her A gun turret. Her B turret takes a direct hit, disabling one of the guns and another barrel bursts in her aft turret. Rodney moves in closer, pounding Bismarck with continuous broadsides. So much fire! The shorter range secondary guns on the King George V are brought into action. She never raises a flag of surrender, and so the onslaught continues. Over an hour later, the British commanders cannot help but look at Bismarck in awe and admiration. The mighty ship has taken a pounding, and remains afloat for now. A burning wreck, but still defiantly flying her colours, she never surrenders. Knowing that the job is done, and the German U-boats are nearby, the British withdraw. Dorsetshire torpedoes Bismarck, and then begins to pick up survivors with the destroyer Maori. 
shortly after the Bismarck finally goes under the waves. The loss resulted in the German command deciding that they would never again risk German battleships to raid supply convoys in the Atlantic. After the sinking, Admiral John Tovey of the Royal Navy said, The Bismarck had put up a most gallant fight against impossible odds, worthy of the old days of the Imperial German Navy, and she went down with her colours flying. Oh boy, never gave up, never surrendered. Uh, a lot of men died because of that, of course. But it is admirable, at least, how brave they were. <laughs> Very cool story, I like it. I think Bismarck had more of a fight than Yama Yamato. I think Yamato's story was unclimactic. Not climax. <laughs> the climax was boring. Anticlimactic. Bismarck had a story, I like it. My friends, suggest videos to me in the comments, I read all of the comments. Thank you for watching and thank you for being a Patreon. As always, until my next video, stay cool and bye bye.